This is all of history on one graph. The x-axis is logarithm of time, approaching time in the near future, so it all can fit. And on the y-axis is a growth rate. For the human era, it shows the growth of foragers, then farmers, and then industry. And before that, it shows animals and genes. And the key pattern to see here is that over entire history is well summarized by exponential growth modes, where the y-axis here is the growth rate again. And during each era, it grew very steadily until all of a sudden, within less than a previous doubling time, the growth rate increased by a factor of 50 or more. So human foragers doubled roughly every quarter million years. And then around 10,000 years ago, all of a sudden farmers started doubling every 1,000 years. And then around two or 300 years ago, industry started doubling every 15 years. If that pattern were to continue, then sometime roughly in the next century, we would see a transition that took five years, and within that time, the economy would go from doubling every 15 years to doubling every month or faster. Uh, and that would all be over in a year or two, <laughs> and then something else would happen. That would be the trajectory here. What could possibly cause such an enormous change? One of the things people have talked about as a big potential change in the future over the next century or so are smart robots, artificial intelligence, machines that can do most tasks as well as people. And there are many ways that that might happen. I'm going to focus on one of them called brain emulation. The idea is to port the software that already exists in our brains into computers. So for that, we need three things. We need lots of fast, cheap, parallel computers. We don't have yet. We also don't have ways to scan the brain in fine enough spatial and chemical detail to see exactly what's where. And then third, we need computer models of how each type of brain cell works, taking input signals, internal state changes, and then output signals. And if those models of the brain cells are good enough, and the scan is good enough to figure out what type each brain cell is, then the entire model should be good enough. And a good enough model, you could cook it up with hands, eyes, mouth, ears, and you could talk to it, it would talk back, it would act just like the original person would have in the same situation. It would love, it would hate, it would be creative, etc. It would be a complete substitute for human workers because it would be, in essence, a human mind in a machine. Now, many people over the years have talked about this. This has been a staple of science fiction and futurism for decades. People have talked about it a lot, and when they talk about it, the conversation usually goes in these directions. Is it really possible to make a machine that substitutes for a human? Could flesh and blood really be emulated by a machine? If you made a machine like this, would it be conscious? If you made a, an emulation of me, is it me or is it someone else? Those are all fascinating questions that I'm going to ignore. I'm going to focus on the question I think has been neglected, which is, what happens if we actually make these things? How does the world change? This is a map of all of academia connected by citations, i.e. which fields cite which, how often. And in my checkered history, I have done a wide range of fields. That's not rewarded by academia, but it's good here because I'm going to be able to use this to uh, apply all I know about many fields to this scenario. So it'll let me pick the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> I'm going to go area by area. When things are easy, I'll draw the easy conclusions. When they get hard, I'll go on to the next one. I'm also going to do what we theorists do everywhere, look for our keys under the lamppost, i.e., we make simplifying assumptions so that we can figure things out under our assumptions. This means we don't find the keys under the lamppost, but we have a good map of the dark, so we can go exploring there. So to summarize my method, uh, before I go on to tell you the implications, first, I'm going to just apply academic consensus. I'm not trying to be creative or original other than asking this unusual question, what would happen if we actually had brain emulations? I'm also not going to try to make an ideal world, a heaven or a hell. I'm just going to tell you what seems most likely if we do the least to avoid it. It's not my job to make you like the world I'm going to describe. You can like it or not. My job is to tell you what it's likely to be like if we do nothing to change it. Oh, robots are where the action is, so I'm going to focus on that. I'll just have a few words to say about humans. I'm not going to tell you about the entire future of the universe trillions a year from now. My ambition is only to tell you about the next great era after ours that's as different from our era as we are from farmers or foragers. And I'm not going to tell you about the transition that goes from here to there. 
There are many disruptive things that can happen in transition. I'm just going to tell you once we get used to it. As an economist, we're going to use our standard simplifying assumption of supply and demand. Uh, it's our best first cut analysis of social situations. And finally, I'm going to focus on opaque M's. So, again, we make this emulation, we run it on a computer. I assume that we can turn it on, turn it off, run it fast or slow, make a copy, erase it. Those are the things we can do, but we can't take one guy's music and combine it with another person's sport and make combinations. We can't go in and edit, we can just use it as a black box. It's spaghetti code we don't understand. So, those are my assumptions, and based on those assumptions, I have written a book that's available now with the title of this talk, The Age of M, Work, Love, and Life, When Robots Rule the Earth, and now I'm going to tell you about just a few of the many implications I describe in that book. The first set of implications I have for you are implications that apply to any sort of robot-dominated future. And the key idea is that robots can be represented as computer files. So, you can make a computer file immortal. You can make archive it. Now, just like today, cars and houses are immortal. If you keep repairing them, they could last forever. That doesn't mean you do keep repairing them. They may not actually be immortal, they just could be. <laughs> Travel can be done electronically. You have an electronic file, you send it over a communication line. So you can go across the world by uh, taking the computer file out of the robot body, sending it across the world, and downloading it into a new body. We are afraid that we'll, if we kill nature, we will die. Robots know that they could kill nature and they would survive. That is, they're built in factories out of stuff dug up in mines, so they may worry less about killing nature. Finally, a computer file, you can make copies of it, and that has enormous implications. First of all, it means that very quickly the number of robots expands so that the wage falls down to subsistence level for robots. This is a Malthusian world for the robots. They are working most of the time and what their money they're getting is paying mainly for the basics they need to survive. They need computer hardware, energy, cooling, infrastructure, uh, repairs, uh, communication lines, things like that. Uh, because you can expand the population of these emulations as fast as you can make them in factories, which is fast, the robot economy can grow very fast. It can double every month or faster, according to standard economic theory. That's not crazy here. And if it takes a, month, a year to get to Mars and the economy is doubling every month, it just gets ridiculously long delays. They won't bother much with space during the M era. Humans have to retire. The wages fall to subsistence level for the emulations, which is well below subsistence level for humans, so humans must and must retire all of a sudden. Now, humans start out owning basically everything in this new economy. They own a lot for a long time. Their investments double every month if the economy doubles every month, so humans collectively get very rich and can enjoy a luxurious retirement. Collectively. Whether any one person does depends on how well humans share and insure. As you know, this has varied across history. It's likely to vary in the future. You can predict what happens. Uh, many people have said, why would the emulations leave the humans around? Why don't they just get rid of us? What use are we? Notice we have retirees in our world that we rarely say, gee, let's go kill off all the retirees and take their stuff. What good are they to us? That's in part because you like them, but it's probably more because that would threaten the stability of the institutions you share with them, financial, political, uh, legal. And similarly, the emulations might be afraid of threatening the institutions they share with us by trying to kill off all the humans. But if this era only lasts two years, of course, I can't say very much about what happens after that. All of the emulations started out as human. So they have the usual range of human characteristics. They are very much like human, but they are not representative humans. So if you look at some space of characteristics, say how smart or hardworking they are, the people who copy emulations and train them and try to distribute them will be focused on the most productive emulations in this very competitive M economy. Those very productive emulations will be distinctively different. They will be more productive. And so we can predict many features of them. In fact, most emulations will come from, say, the few hundred most productive humans. That makes them as elite or more elite than the typical human billionaire, head of state, Olympic gold medalist, Nobel Prize winner, that sort of people. That's the quality of productivity of the typical emulation. We can predict many things about this sort of people because we know in our world what tends to correlate with people being more productive. So they tend to be hardworking, smart, they tend to be married, religious, they tend to be a peak age of, say, near 40 or 50, which is the peak productivity age for us. That's what emulations look like, the kind of characteristics that are the most productive among humans. 
Most jobs in our economy, an advanced economy, are desk jobs. So that'll be true for the emulations as well. As long as they're at a desk job, it might as well be a virtual reality desk. And because it's very cheap, it might as well be ridiculously luxurious, beautiful, comfortable. Emulations and virtual reality never need to be, feel hunger, pain, disease, grime. They're always physically beautiful. That's the world they live in, but, and it's beautiful like this, but nevertheless, it's offices and desks. They are working most of the time. They are workaholics, but they're very good at their jobs. Let's think about some of the varieties of lives that M can have. This is your life. You start and then you end. This is an emulation who every day splits off a few copies to do short-term tasks, and then those copies either end or retire. And this is much more productive. That is, for a worker who rests during at night and has leisure and then works during the day, maybe a third of their total time is spent working. For these spur copies, all of their time can be spent working, so that's much more productive. So they will often make these copies to stay in line at the DMV, fill out forms, things they don't need to remember. This is a more opportunistic M. They make more copies when there is more demand for different versions of themselves, and eventually there's less demand, and that's their life. This could be an M software engineer or other sort of designer. They conceive of a design for a whole system, then they break into copies that then focus on subparts and design those all the way down to designing the entire system. Th in this way, emulations can conceive of and implement larger, more coherent designs than we humans can. This is an emulation plumber. For the last 20 years, he remembers every day only ever working two hours a day. Every day, when he was ready for work, a thousand copies were made, <laughs> who worked for two hours, all but one were erased, and the last copy went on to the next day. So objectively, he's working 99% of the time. Subjectively, he remembers a life of leisure. So they're working very hard, but they don't have to see it that way. Now, many systems that we know of, including the human mind, have the feature that as they get older and more experienced and adapted to some circumstances, they become harder to readapt to new circumstances. This is the phenomenon of software rot. If any of you write software, large software systems become fragile. And you have to write them again from scratch. Human minds start out with fluid intelligence. And eventually, we have crystallized intelligence. So because of this, emulations have a limited career length before they must retire. Even though they can be physically immortal, they cannot last productively forever. And so there must be new copies of them that are made from their original young version who are trained in new ways all the time. So M's would always see some older versions of themselves around and some younger versions doing similar things, and they would have a very good idea what their future is like. This again is you. Now, this could be you who, at the beginning of a party, took a drug, which means you will not remember this party the next day or ever after. So that means your memories are taken from what you were at the beginning of the party. Now, at the end of this party, will you, ask, will you say to yourself, I'm about to die, this is terrible, and be very stressed about it, and ask yourself why you ever got into this? Maybe not. If you would find that acceptable and not death, maybe you could see why most emulations would also find this acceptable. This is the scenario of splitting off a spur copy who stands in line at the DMV, does their task, and then ends. From the emulation's point of view, they can see this as part of me that I don't remember. They could, of course, see it another way, but the emulation world will select for emulations that see it this way. This is the productive way to see things, and the emulation world is very competitive and it selects for the productive attitudes. So this is how they'll see it. This is okay from their point of view. Now, even if it's okay for me to end, because that's part of me, if I interact with other people around me, and then I don't remember later what I said to them, that could bug them. Uh, so it's more convenient if M's are created together as a team copy, oh, you copy a whole team and that whole team works together and then that whole team gets erased or retires and then they can deal with these things more smoothly. Here's another uh, scenario that M's can do that we can't. So in our world it's hard to meet celebrities. They have limited time. It's hard to meet the president, for example. But for emulations it's easy to meet celebrities. They spin off a copy to meet whoever they want to meet with and then the, that copy can end after the meeting. So the hard thing about M celebrities is to get them to remember your meeting, <laughs> but it's easy to meet them. We can use this in order to trust M leaders. So for example, today if somebody says, we, your leader says we must invade Iraq, and you say, gee, why must we invade Iraq? And they might say, it's a state secret, we can't tell you. You'll just have to trust me. You're not sure whether you can trust them. But for M's, what they can do is you can split off a copy of yourself, and the leader splits off a copy of themselves. They both go into the safe together. And then inside the safe, the leader can explain all of their secret reasons. And then at the end of this meeting, 
All that happens is one bit comes out. You decide if you were convinced by the argument. And now your original hears, was I or was not, not convinced by the argument that, in fact, we must invade Iraq or whatever she was sold. So this will allow M's to more selectively share secrets. You can trust your leaders more because a copy of yourself a few seconds ago decided that, in fact, they were trustworthy, even though they can't tell you their reasons. Now, emulations can run at a number of different speeds. And this means uh, a lot for the emulation world. It means they, they change culture in many ways. So uh, because the brain is very parallel, this means that if you add more parallel hardware, you, you can run faster. If you add twice as much hardware, which costs twice as much, you can run twice as fast, or half as much hardware and run half as fast. So over a very wide range, emulations can pay more to run faster or pay less to run slower. So initially, the most emulations would run at human speed, so they interact with humans. But eventually, I estimate roughly the typical emulation will run a thousand times human speed, which means their world is actually more stable to them than your world is to you. And Emulations can run up all the way up to a million times human speed, and you'll notice that they'll probably clump into classes so that they can interact with others at the same speed for the same reason we clump into cities. And the higher class M's are actually higher status in many ways. So they uh, host meetings, they embody more wealth, they know things first, and this is a class hierarchy. M's live in a class hierarchy, which is culturally distinct because, in fact, it'll be very hard to synchronize classes at different speeds. Oh, the, you know, the rate at which music fashions change in one will just be very different than the rate, equivalent rate in another society. And so it's a world of class hierarchy where the high class really are worth more, they embody more wealth. And uh, when you retire, you probably retire to a slower speed because that's a lot cheaper. So all those things that are ending, they could just retire to a slower speed. But slower speed M's are more like ghosts in many ways, especially retired M's. <laughs> so, in our culture, the idea of a ghost is something that's floating around, it's available to talk to, but it usually, if you manage to talk to it, it's not really very well informed, it can't influence things very much, it's not very interesting to talk to, it doesn't matter very much, and uh, it, it hardly changes much over a long time, it remembers old things, it's obsessed with old ways, it, and those what emulation retirees are like. So basically, M's, uh, working M's have this cloud of uh, retirees around them they could talk to who are very ghostly-like, that they don't want to talk to, just like we wouldn't really want to talk to ghosts most of the time if we could either. Um, and there are many more things to find in the book. Thank you very much.